great paradise. California is a great region for growing grapes. It's also wine country. There was a great revolution in California. Now our wines have been adjudged to be superior in general to the French wines. Get ready for some phenomenal facts about the Golden State that are sure to surprise you. Hi, I'm Chris Bauer. And I'm Blanca Campa. Welcome to Inbox. If you're a wine drinker, the wine you choose says something about you. Whether you choose red or white, or if you don't drink at all, you might be interested in learning why California is a special place in the development of wine. Today you'll hear from several winemakers as they explain why California is the perfect place for premier winemaking. These vintners are some of the best in the world, and they'll be sharing their intimate knowledge with us. California is the leading wine producing state in the U.S., making about 90% of all American wine. And California is the fourth leading wine producer in the world. Wine is virtually the only thing you can eat or drink in the world that reflects the very ground it was grown in. The best wine is produced by using the best grapes. It's a really great region for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. The Pinot Noir grape itself is a very delicate grape, but it does benefit from a number of things that we have here. There are more than 500,000 acres of wine grapes growing in beautiful Cali. All 50 states produce wine, but why is California the top wine producer? One of the reasons California is so valued is because their terroir Wait a minute, what was that word? Terroir? What exactly does that mean? Terroir just means the, uh, the soil. The environment. The weather. The sun. The Pacific Ocean. It's the word that encompasses all the elements of growing grapes. There really isn't an English word that comes close to describing it. Terroir, which is a French word not pronounced correctly there. It actually has two definitions. One a definition has to do with both the uh, physical geography, climate, soil, all these different physical factors that can influence the grape as it grows. The other definition of a terroir is the final outcome, the final product, which is taking all those ingredients which created the grape and then the winemaker's own input. Thank you, Steve. But who can tell us how the terroir affects the grape? You could have the exact same grape varietal planted in two different locations, they're going to taste very different just because of the types of soil, influence that Mother Nature has on them with weather, the overall farm. So a lot of people will try to emphasize the terroir in their wines. For example, Napa and Sonoma are very close to each other, but their terroir is actually very different, producing different types of grapes. Sonoma County has a lot of Chardonnay planted, a lot of Pinot Noir, a lot of Zinfandel, Cabernet, some are low, also a lot of Syrah and Grenache in specific areas uh, throughout Sonoma County. But as to where Napa is more of the kind of Bordeaux style valley where they kind of focus on their bigger reds, their Cabernets, their Merlots, uh, Petit Verdots and stuff like that. Sonoma tends to be a bit cooler, which is a lot better for you know more Chardonnay, more Pinot Noir and cooler climate, big varietals. The geographic location of California creates a unique environment that is treasured because of the wonderful climate. It's a Mediterranean climate which mirrors the, uh, the climates of, uh, of Europe. To grow world-class uh, wine grapes, you need to have warm temperatures. Because what you get here is very hot during the day. And then that's offset by the moisture that comes up from the ocean. California being so close to the Pacific Ocean, it provides a natural air conditioning of sorts. The fog always comes in at night, cooling the grapes down, so it slows that ripening process. That's why we're able to extract such intense flavors out of our grapes. The unique terroir of California produces more than 110 varieties of wine grapes. 
and there are more than 2,800 wineries that produce more than 17 million gallons of wine per year. This is why California wine has great reputation worldwide. Growing on thousands of years of winemaking with grapes that are even older, can there really be such a thing as modern wine? Today, you are talking about whether it's a European style or uh, a New World style. Or you would say Old World versus New World. Modern wines, you might say, are, are the ones that are trendy. Modern winemaking style, just really thinking outside the box and doing something different than everyone else. New World winemakers are more open to experimenting with different methods. I don't like to use a lot of the modern technology. But there's obviously new technologies like with bottling lines that you'll get shots of today, different tanks. They even have computerized grape sorting systems that will, you know, pick out bad grapes with a computer and basically spray them off with little air nozzles. Wine's been made for 5,000 years here and um, the process is basically the same. You crush the grapes and you add yeast. It's the yeast that really makes the wine. The process is pretty universal across uh, both Old World and New World. Um, you know, we all go through the same basic steps. So some of the technology has gotten pretty advanced. Um, a lot of it's still very traditional and just uh, fermenting grapes and trying to make the best tasting wine possible. We have learned more about keeping things clean, and yes, there's things like um, cooling systems for your tank, which wasn't around 5,000 years ago, but that's why people made wine in caves. Who knows, they might come up with something that might be trendy and cool and you know, be a really enjoyable wine. So let's review the tools and techniques to make modern wine. This is where it all begins. Grape goes through the hopper and it drops down into here. And so when the grapes come down, they go through the center of the baskets where the berries and the, the stems get hit by these paddles. They knock the berries off, so, and all the grapes go through the little holes in the basket. This is actually a fermenting tank. So what we do is we uh, will crush the grapes, and then it pumps into the tank. And then we add the yeast and the ferment about four days into the fermentation. We then check the sugars and see where they are, and if they need if it needs to be fortified. So within, if it does, then all the skins and seeds and juice go into that big drum there. It's called a press. It's a bag and it inflates with air and it squishes all the skins and seeds up against the side of the tank and it drains into this hopper right here. Despite all that stainless steel and automation, one critical material remains unchanged. In the wine industry, you use oak barrels. But wait, even the oak comes in special varieties, and that influences the wine. You see a beautiful woman, and you know she's wearing perfume, but you can't quite figure out what it is. That's exactly the right amount of perfume to wear, and that's exactly the right amount of oak you want in wine. It gives a little bit of oak influence, just to add to the complexity to the wine, but doesn't overpower it, so tasting like a wood shop or something like that. So. If you can name the perfume, she has too much perfume on. And if you taste the oak, if it's a strong, that's too much oak. And that's a winemaker's art. And that's determined by how much new oak you use for your wine. It's new oak, used oak. So obviously, the newer the oak, the more oak influence that you'll have on the wines. When we bottle our Chardonnay this past year, we used 15% new oak. All the other barrels were neutral. And it gives just that hint of oak that we're after. The barrel picks what type of oak we're gonna use on the wine, whether it be American, French, there's also Spanish, Hungarian oak. We've tried American oak and they're just not quite as good. American oak tends to be a little bit bigger, a little bit in your face. Uh, there's a lot of dill to it. Much less expensive, but they don't quite 
provide the same aromas that we get from French oak barrels. Some people really like it, especially um, uh, some cab producers. It's very popular with Cabernet because it adds some extra vanilla to it. But if you're producing a delicate wine like a Grenache uh, or a Chardonnay or Pinot Noir, you want to have a little bit of finesse and, and feminine touch to it. And that typically is why you would pick a French barrel because it has a softer influence on the wine. Uh, the French make wonderful barrels. It's perhaps their only cultural contribution to the world other than a love for Jerry Lewis. I never quite figured that out. From the barrel to the bottle takes time as long as 18 months for the wine to ferment. And it might surprise you to learn that the wine doesn't go to the bottling plant. The bottlers come to the wine. just might be the least exciting part of the wine craft. Do I like bottling? Uh, no. Do we like bottling? Yes. Bottling. <laughs> I hate bottling. <laughs> it's a challenge every day. Bottling now is pretty easy because they, they use mobile bottling lines and it's very automated. We'll do about three bottlings a year. Um, we'll have our rosé bottling, um, our Grenache bottling. A lot of wineries don't have a lot of space to have a bottling line or the cash flow to have a bottling line. So what they do, there's a lot of companies that have bottling lines on back of semi-trucks. We uh, just travel from winery to winery. Most wineries can't afford to purchase all this equipment. It's too expensive. We just set up our trailer. They provide all the supplies, the corks, the glass, labels. First, we go into the sparger that lifts the bottle up and it gives it three short blasts of nitrogen. And it also replaces the oxygen with nitrogen, which is inert, will not damage the wine. Then it comes on the filler. It gets filled to a specific height, which we can adjust up and down. Bottling, the, the hard part is, you know, after you've made the wine and you've aged it for however long you needed to, then you do the final blend. It's just another step in production cycle where you can mess up your wine. And then there's a whole new set of problems. You know, you get your wine exactly to where you want it to be. It's tasting perfectly. And then if bottling goes wrong, for the most part, it's okay. I just don't <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> bottling is a very important part of it. And of course, the, the creativity that goes into the labels. And down here is our applicator and foil spinner. It pops the foil on and it spins down the foil. And the machine right here just puts the label on. So, And then by the time it comes down here, two people pack it in a box, off it goes. Bottling gives you an opportunity to be very creative in the glassware that you pick, the type of uh, cork that you use. A lot of people use different uh, closures, uh, cork obviously is the traditional method. It goes through either the corker or the cap, depending on what style they want to use. We've tried many, many corks over the years and many of them failed. For me, I like screw caps for a very simple, kind of easy drinking wine. The tradition of corks, rather than screw closures or any other type of closure, because we're old men, we like the tradition of, of wine. There is a, a certain amount of uh, oxygen exchanged through a, a normal cork, and, uh, and there might be a lack of oxygen exchange from different types of synthetic corks that affect the wine in, in the end. So if you want to age a wine for uh, several years, it's going to taste different. Rose Thurston will tell you there's as much romance in corks as in wine. So here is an example of what the bark looks like when it's peeled off of the cork tree. Um, this is just where they would use uh, an axe by hand once they climb the tree to open it up and then they'll um, just peel it right off and that's part of how um, it's a sustainable product because the tree can just grow it right back and they can harvest it again. So in... it's safe for the tree? Yeah, it's totally This gives you an idea of the different um, cork qualities that are available. 
you can see that there's um, some corks that have some pieces that are a little bit darker. The more expensive red wines people ex expect to have longer, you would want to have more of a, a more solid um, cork. You have a wine that's going to be opened um, fairly quickly, then you could get away with one of these corks that's a, a little bit more porous. Wonderful to hear that cork come out. In my opinion, actually helps to age the wine a little bit better than a screw cap. I like to take a corkscrew and open a bottle of wine. I think there's a certain romance to it. There's more to wine tasting than the tasting. There is sight and smell too. Tasting wine, it's very personal. Don't be intimidated. Say the first thing that comes to your head. If you're new to tasting wine, try everything. Until you find what you do like. Some wines will be uh, very drinkable at their height for a period of time. What you also find out as you probably all notice as you drink through a bottle of wine, uh, that you know, the middle, as you're halfway through the bottle of the wine, it can taste quite differently from the beginning of the bottle. Because as the wine oxidizes, particularly the reds, will oxidize in the air, and uh, the flavor and bouquet can change over time. Wine tasting is a hobby for many wine drinkers. Wine tasting is also an acquired skill that you can only get through experience. Peter Prager explains the nuances of wine tasting. The first thing about wine, or anything that you're trying to show people is does it look good you know just by looking at it do you like the way it, it looks and so a lot of times you'll hold it up to see if it's if it's bright and then you would what you have to do is what they call volatilizing your esters and so it concentrates the uh, aroma so you can have a good smell as it does is it concentrates those aromas up to, to the glass that's an important feature because majority of what you actually taste is what you smell. And then you get a lot of air going through your mouth and through the wine, which again opens it up so you get much more of the flavor on the palate. But the most important thing is when you swallow it, you go on, that was good. Are you interested in making wine at home? With all the advances in technology today, we don't see many people crushing grapes with a press or smashing grapes with their feet. Many of our winemakers actually started making wine at home. Uh, making wine at home isn't hard. Find out it's a lot of work. It can be rewarding. Well, you're never doing it wrong. Have fun. Uh, it's completely legal. You have to enjoy it. It takes patience know that you're going to make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and it can be very educational when it goes wrong. <laughs> Even though it doesn't taste the best in the world, you're never doing it wrong. Uh, but keep trying and, um, you know, eventually you, you'll, you'll make something that, that you'll really appreciate. You will, you know, you find out what you don't like about it and then you go to books or, the, or to the internet and find out how to fix that. Wait a minute. I know we all don't have all the time in the world to make wine, but what about those of us who actually have the motivation to make our own wine at home? You need grapes, number one. You would, need a, you would need a couple vessels, one to crush your grapes into and ferment, and then have another container so you can press that juice off. Is, is as you're pressing, you have to pump it into another empty container. You would need a, a press. You would need a, a, a way of crushing the grapes. Let's see. All we need are some grape vessels, two containers, and a press. How much is this going to cost me? You don't have to go out and buy these things. There's a lot of different ways you can do this at home. Just with the old way, smashing it with your feet. You know, uh, you, if it's for home wine, you can do it like, like that. Uh, you don't need modern equipment. Wow, now I don't feel as intimidated. Use those tips and your imagination and get your palate excited about homemade wine. We've learned about terroir. And about modern and traditional.
traditional winemaking techniques. About storing and bottling. And about how to taste wine. Now you're a wine expert. I've got the grapes. I've got the yeast. So who's going to crush the grapes? Who has bigger feet? Well, mine might be a little bit bigger, but maybe yours are more beautiful. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Inbox. Cheers. Cheers.